Hello, and welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land to talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way, which obviously includes 42. <laughs> I am joined here today by uh, Greg Uttinger and Emily Maxson, and I am your host today, Brian Broom. Today, we are going to be talking about Whereas last week we discussed the death of Saul and the impending coronation of David, and now we are discussing the arrival of the Ark by David's hand to Jerusalem. Greg, why don't you start us off? Well, Ark of the Covenant levels mountains, shoots electric... Bo- no, okay, was, <laughs> that's a move. The Ark of the Covenant had been more or less the focus of the Mosaic Covenant. It's uh, God's footstool. He would be enthroned above it on the wings of the cherubim and in the midst of the praises of Israel. But toward the end of the period of the judges, the children of Israel had decided it would function like some kind of magical attack device and had taken it into battle against the Philistines and had promptly lost it. It had gone, God himself had gone into captivity amongst the Philistines, taking God, uh, Israel's punishment upon themselves, the punishment of exile. And once in Philistine territory, God had waged war against their gods and returned on a cart, because that's how the Philistines sent it back in desperation. And the cart uh, carrying the ark came to some random place in some random corner of Israel. And people showed it disrespect. They came to sacrilege. They looked in it. Apparently at this time, this was also when um, the pot of manna and Aaron's rod must have been taken out because there's no other record of anyone else ever moving that stuff. And this is the one time it was open. Uh, so th- this was this was altogether bad, and God plagued his own people. Uh, and so they decided to palm it off on a nearby Gibeonite city, Kirjath Jirim, which was, as I say, a Gibeonite city. Now, the Gibeonites were Canaanites. Well, what are they doing here? Shouldn't they have been exterminated? Yeah. Ideally, well, theoretically, possibly, but these these Canaanites had come in disguise to Joshua and all Israel at the time of the conquest and had pretended to be from very far away. And they had put on old clothes and taken old food and old horses and whatever else they had done and convinced Israel, who forgot to check with God, that they were very far, from very far away. And they come because of God's name and they Israel basically signed an aggression pact with them. And then suddenly discovers, wait, you guys live just over the corner there. What's this all about? Well, you know, we didn't want to die. So, well, you're going to be servants to the tabernacle forever and ever. Sounds good to us. And so they were. They had become Levitical servants, serving some of them with the tabernacle, other Levitical cities or near them. And um, this, this has been a thing. So when God's people feel the holiness of God pressing upon them a bit too much, they take this ark, which which should be the thing that ties the whole Mosaic Covenant together, and they do not send it back to the tabernacle where it belongs. It never goes back to the tabernacle. They send it to Kirjath Jerob, the Gibeonites, and it stays there for a long time. Just within the, um, the first text, which is 1 Samuel 7, verse 2, It was there at least 20 years, but that's just 20 years until the revival led by Samuel. And then there was more time after that during which Samuel continued. And then all of Saul's 40-year reign, and now uh, at least seven years by David, plus, plus a bit. So it's been sitting in this Gentile town for a long, long time. And God's people have been apparently just fine with that. But now that David has come to the throne and he's taken Jerusalem, the old city of Melchizedek, and he's he's understood, probably by divine revelation, that this this is where his capital should be, and that this is where God wants the ark to be. See Psalm 132 in this context, where he describes a bit of his seeking out a place for the for the for the ark of the covenant. He says that God desired Zion, Zion. Well, Zion was this little crag of a mountain. In the middle of Jerusalem, uh, that where David would build his palace, and David decides that well, his palace is there, and therefore God's palace should should be there. Well, he's going to bring God's throne, uh, footstool, there first. 
And in a moment of great rejoicing after its coronation, everybody's agreeing, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So they all get excited. And they're having this big revival meeting, as it were. And David says, let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not of it in the days of Saul. The congregation said that they would do so. The thing was right in the eyes of the people. It, it, the, the idea is good. This is First Chronicles 13. So David gathered all Israel together from Shihor of Egypt into the entering into Hamath, that's up north near Syria, to bring the ark of God from Kerjath Jerob. And David went up in all Israel to Bela, that is to Kerjath Jerob, that belonged to Judah to bring up thence the ark of the God of God the Lord who dwells between the cherubim, whose name is called upon it, and they carry the ark of God in a new cart. Uh oh. See, the Philistines had transported the ark into covenant when they wanted it to go away. They'd attached it to some milk cows and said shoo and trusted that if this was really a God thing, that God's providence would lead them home, and it had. So somehow David and the elders get the idea, and the Levites get the idea of um hey, that's faster than carrying it the way we're supposed to. Let's do that. In other words, let's find out how the pagans worship because <laughs> it's more efficient and more effective. It'll speed things up. And let's adopt their technology for worship. Now, there's nothing wrong with carts. Israel used carts. There are places for carts. This was not one of them. The prescription of the law was that when the ark was transported, there were little loops on the corners of the ark that staves went through and you lifted up the ark with these staves, these sticks and um, one or two guys in front, one or two guys in back and they carried the ark on their shoulders. That's how it was supposed to be done. That's not how Israel was doing it. Well, people are not noticing this because everyone's so excited that this thing is from the Lord. It's a thing that needs to be done. It's a great thing. Everybody agrees this is what God wants. And no one seems to notice a uh, guy should not do it the way God said. And David and all Israel played before the Lord with all their might, with singing, with harps, with psalteries, with timbrels, and with cymbals and with trumpets. Now that's something new. Uh, we have seen a slight use of musical instruments in the past. The only ones that were ordained in the law was the blowing of trumpets over the sacrifices to lift them up to God. So there was an idea there, but there wasn't any explicit provision for it. You can think of the after the Red Sea crossing, the defeat of the Egyptians, the women go out with basically tambourines. And um, there's mention, it seems, in um, Judges, when Deborah sings her song, the bear seems to be there doing some kind of accompaniment. So Israel certainly had musical instruments, and they were not afraid to use them in some forms of worship, but God had never made a big deal over it. But David, of course, is a musician. A musician. He's, he's a psalm writer. He plays the harp himself. He may have played other instruments. And so this seems a great time to celebrate with music. And there's nothing here where God suggests, wait, that's wrong. And, and throughout all of this, when the issue is, are you worshiping God right? No one criticizes the music. God never says, oh, and by the way, that music stuff, where'd you get that idea? No, it seems, it seems to be exactly right. And David seems to be moved by the Spirit to understand that this is appropriate. We'll see more music as we go along. But the carrying on a cart is still an issue. Verse, this is chapter 13 of First Chronicles again, verse 9. And when they came into the threshing floor of Kaidan, Uzzah, one of the drivers of the cart, put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. All right, here's the, here's the situation. They're going along, they're going to a threshing floor. Threshing floors have a lot of significance in Scripture because they're a place where you thresh things out. They're symbolically <laughs> a point of decision-making. Israel is God's threshing floor. Uh, Jesus comes to his threshing floor, John the Baptist says. So here's a point of decision. And something goes wrong. The oxen stumble or trip or, or something happens mm -hmm. to the point that the cart is shaking and Uzzah, who's a Levite and whose job it probably was to carry the thing, instead he's riding the cart, sees the ark start to totter and tip and thinks, oh, with what few seconds of, if that, of time he has, he thinks, if this thing falls, it's just a box. It's got heavy stone tablets in it. Uh, it's likely to break. And this is, these tablets, Moses had a pair of these and he broke them pretty easily by throwing them down. This this, this would be horrible. 
um, not simply historical or archaeologically or any of that aesthetically. This is this is the coveted document. This could be this could amount to if the if the tables break, this could amount to tearing up the covenant with God. Even failing that, if it's just the box breaks, this is God's footstool on the cherubim or his throne. This is really bad. Surely God would not mind if I just touched it a little to steady it, because it would be bad for it to break, and it would be bad for it to break, no doubt. Which is why God gave instructions <laughs> on how to transport it. How to carry it carefully. Yeah. I got to I gotta push back on that a little bit. Like, couldn't it just have been instinctive even? Like, well, you that, know, when something, you see it out of the corner of your eye and it's falling sure. over, you reach out to catch it. Well, sure. I was, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt that he actually thought about things. <laughs> I mean, it, it could could it be purely instinctive? Of course, it could. Yeah, I purely instinctively committed sacrilege. That I don't think that helps. I, I, <laughs> That's I'm, true. I'm, I'm kind of giving him the benefit of the doubt and saying he had a second to process it, and and took his chances. If not, uh, that was stupid beyond belief. I, you blindly reach out and touch something holy. What God has said carries a death penalty because you're in a position that you're so casual that you're not even thinking what's going on. That, that I'm sorry, that's no improvement. But whatever happens, He does put His hand out. He does He does uh, stop it from falling. So so far so good. But God, it says, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Azza, and He smote him because He put His hand to the ark. There He died before God. God's presence with God, the God's presence with with went with the ark. God was there, that is, by His special presence, by His sacramental presence with the ark, and God killed him because God. And this, and this was not He didn't know. The law contains specific instructions about how to transport the thing, but the law also, from here here and there, contained warnings about touching the holy things. In mm -hmm. fact, one of the jobs of the Levites was to protect the holy things, so people didn't touch them. In fact, the ark isn't even supposed to be out in the open. Anytime it was carried, it was supposed to be covered, covered with the, the blue claws of the tabernacle. So he was supposed to know this. When God gives you a job, you're supposed to read the user's manual <laughs> so that you, you can be competent with it. Uh, and, and sometimes you don't maybe don't have a lot of time to read all the manuals if it's a field promotion. But these Levites hadn't had anything to do for a long time. They should have known. They well, should have been paying I attention. I think too that's something that people forget when they bring this up as like a, a criticism of of God yeah. or anything. It's like, oh, well, well, he was just trying to help. He was just yes. being <laughs> a helpful, a good Samaritan. Isn't that what Jesus talks about? Yeah. <laughs> and the the problem with that is is that this is a detail I even forgotten or just completely missed is that he's a Levite. Mm -hmm. He is, for lack of a better modern analog, a preacher. Yeah, and he's supposed to be held to a higher standard of like what the law says to do. <laughs> actually, um, knowing the Bible, <laughs> actually knowing the Bible, it'd be akin to saying, "Well, he thought he was doing the right thing," in some kind of misguided defense of uh, you know somebody embezzling funds from a, a church fund. It's like he, you are held to a higher standard, or or to 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 bring it into at least more similar. It's like, well, he thought. What he was doing was right, as he was, uh, you know, teaching heresy to his congregants based on his <laughs> misunderstanding of scripture. Yeah, uh, I, I doubt he had any ill will. I think he had the best of intentions, even if they were instinctive intentions. Oh, protect the thing so it doesn't fall and break. Mm -hmm. <sighs> but he wasn't supposed to do that. It was right. presumption, and God judged him by the standard that God had set for him. David had the, the attitude that most moderns have toward him. David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach of Uzzah. More of that place is called Perezuzah to this day, the breach of Anuzzah. So David even named it that. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? Ah. Uh, <laughs> uh, how? This um, is a mishmash of... Um... Misorganized priorities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes you know, even great godly men, if they're if they're leaders of a movement, see the goal so close, and it's just you know three steps, and we're there. This is this is what everything's been leading to. This is God on the move, 
ignore the fact, as you say, that it involves, well, some dishonest, dishonest mod, uh, handling of funds. It it involves putting someone on the platform with me who's actually, actually not Trinitarian in his theology. And, you know, the, all the things that we may do that we can justify because it we're so close. Mm. And there, there I have, in the history of the church, and perhaps a bit personally, I have known men who have been so strongly motivated by the cause, and, and certainly in political circles, all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. The cause justifies this. And, and, the, and sometimes you talk to them and it's like they, they can't even hear a process. But no, the cause. You're, you're talking trivialities. We're almost there. Let's just do this and get it done. But God is not pragmatic. God is holy. And we're talking here about you want to come into my presence and you did, you disregard the standards I've set for being in my presence. This is not going to work well. Yeah. And so Israel, Jude, and David, they need a wake-up call. Well, what do you, the, the question, of course, is ironic. How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? How about the way God said? But David, <laughs> David was, David's not there. Well, there's also just... You're not bringing the ark home to you. <laughs> oh, yes. That. You're bringing the ark home to God in his presence in the place that he said that the ark should dwell. Mm. Well, God has been in charge of where the ark has been this entire time. I yeah. feel like, <laughs> it's like it you know, God really be hasn't been doing somewhere. a good job. God really hasn't been doing a good job at keeping this where it's supposed to be. And I'm going to fix that. Yeah. Hmm. hmm. Well, now they got to do something with it. And they, the David brought not home to himself. Oh, let me see. David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that he had. Gittite. He's from Gath. He's a Philistine. Gath is the, Gath where Goliath was from? Uh huh. Okay, that, that <laughs> gap. That's oh, that dear. Gap. These ironies are just, you know, overabundant here. Well, let's just, let's just park into this house over here. Who, who owns it? Oh, this Philistine guy from Gap. Um, okay. <laughs> what? Uh, apparently, the man was a believer, perhaps a God-fearer, perhaps a, a, a circumcised member of, of Israel now. We're not told a whole lot, but some, we find out something more about him later. Something happens to him. Uh, and we're not told what it means that God blessed his house. Whatever it was, I mean, in three months, what exactly can happen? His wife and all of the married daughters get pregnant. I, he makes a million dollars in the stock market. I, we don't know what it means. <laughs> Something very visible where people said, whoa, that is visible. Apparently, Elvedon was a godly man already and, and, and no doubt prospered in God's service. But something God did something that was really, really visible. And Obed-Edom did nothing, we, one assumes, except not touch the ark. <laughs> a very passive kind of obedience. Okay, everybody, see that? Don't go near it. Draw the curtain. There's there's lights underneath the curtain. No, don't. Just stay away from it. Go about your business. We have stuff to do. We've got to look. This is not, let's, we're not priests. We're not Levites. We're barely Israelites, so just leave the thing alone. And for three months, it just kind of sits there, and the house is blessed. Well, eventually, and then in the Chronicles account, some other things happened during that time. But Samuel was a little more directly to the, the conclusion. David eventually hears about this. And during that time, he's, he's had time to think it over. And this is in back in First Chronicles again, verse 15. And David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. And actually, the tent is kind of what we're going to talk about. I'm getting a slow start here. And David says publicly, none ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. Mm -hmm. For the, them hath God chosen to carry the ark and to minister unto him forever. Okay, good. And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. And David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites and the sons of Kohath. And there's a list of all kinds of Levites from the various divisions of the tribe. 
uh, and who was who. And David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priests, and again, more Levites. And he says to them this in verse 12, you are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I prepared for it. For because you did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order. Due order. There's a prescribed order for coming to God in worship. Now, under the gospel, it is much more simpler than it was in Israel. Israel was sometimes rather complicated. Certain people had to do certain things at certain times in certain ways with certain items. With us, it has an awful lot to do with preaching the gospel in purity and humbly listening and then responding with praise and prayer. I mean, we don't have the strict liturgies that the Old Testament have, although we do have patterns for uh, a reasonable and logical approach in how to conduct our services. It's not nearly as tight, but God is even more tight about, and you will not commit heresy while you're preaching the gospel. And that's where the, the overwhelming weight of Paul's warnings, the writer of Hebrews, Peter and James come down, uh, John, about let's, and, and, and while you're doing this, don't pollute the gospel message, because that's how God presents himself to us in the new covenant. But anyway, there is a due order in the old covenant and the new covenant. There's a due order. We don't get to make up how we come to God. We don't get to think, what would God like? <laughs> um, from Abel forward, they didn't think. I wonder what God likes. <gasps> you know what? God would like a dead animal. Everyone likes dead animals. I would still love it. You love a dead animal. Everybody loves dead animals. Let's get God a dead animal. No, that's not how that came about. I actually knew a pastor who said something very much like that. He said that since there was no um, prescribed sacrificial rules in Genesis 3 and 4, uh, and we shouldn't add to Scripture by inserting any or imagining any, obviously Abel just came up with the idea himself. Uh, that's well, that's important. also not in scripture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's kind of like when, I mean, I was just reading uh, earlier today about the covenant of works and how uh -huh. people object to the idea of a co covenant of works because the word covenant mm. doesn't show right. up in Genesis <laughs> 1 yeah. through 3. It's like, you're right about the, the terminology not being there, but yeah. is the substance there? And it seems yeah. very clear that it is. I hear some quacking. I think there might be a duck. There might be a duck. Thank you. You beat me to it. I was going to use that. <laughs> Well, anyway, so this time they're going to do it right. They're going to actually obey God when it comes to worship and not follow their imaginations or insert uh, current technology where some other form has already been appointed. You know, I, okay, I'm going to go there. Um, <laughs> God tells us to come together as his people and together as his people in a room hear from the voice of a living man the word of God preached lively, the lively preaching of a word, the confessions and work, the directness of worship say. Are, are, are there other ways to communicate gospel thoughts and words than that? Of course there are. There have been for a long. You can telegraph them. You can send smoke signals. You can play it on the radio. And there may be times and places when all of those things are valid, but that's not the way that God wants to be worshiped on the Lord's day by his people, mm. except in the most extreme of circumstances. The fact that we may have a technology that speeds things up and makes it more comfortable for us and is more trendy because everyone's doing it mm -hmm. does not validate that kind of worship or that attempt to create something that's worship. It doesn't validate it as normative. As normative, exactly. Yeah. As I said, there, there, may, be, there may be exceptions. You know, if the whole congregation is literally in bed sick and the pastor and no one can come. I mean, this can happen. That that really can't happen. And in some churches, I think in the last year, it has happened where everybody's sick. Okay, that's a great time to communicate other ways. But that's not normative. And this was not normative. And because the people thought they knew better than God, God got very upset with them. Well, now they got it right. We're going to seek God after the new order. So the Levites and priests do what they were told. They sanctify themselves. And the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders with the staves thereof, as Moses commanded, according to the word of the Lord. And David spoke to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers with instruments of music, salt trees, and harps and cymbals, sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. And so the Levites appointed were given a bunch of names um, and, and some of their instruments. 
Uh, they have they were to sound with cymbals of brass and psalteries and harps, which told who the instructor in all this music was. But a name that keeps coming up among these people is Obed Edom. Now what? <laughs> Going on a little bit further. So David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the ark of the yeah, this is open your door and there are a thousand people out on your one. Um, to uh, bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. It came to pass when God helped the Levites that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams. Almost like they're surprised that God's being so good to them. They done it right the first time. And David was clothed in a, a robe of fine linen. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to this in a second. But Obed-Edom shows up both in the list of Levites, and yet he's there. And when we're done, he's given a particular title. He becomes a doorkeeper to the Ark of the Lord. Now, it's possible there are two Obed-Edoms, but there's no distinction made. The only hint would be, well, one's a Levite and the other's a Gittite, so they're obviously different. Well, but you see, the last chapter of Leviticus makes provision for how anybody can become a Levite by offering proper sacrifices and giving the proper entry fee. You have to also wonder why a Levite would be named Obed-Edom. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of odd. It's kind That's of odd. So, well, I don't think we have to guess too much given Israel's <laughs> history. <laughs> uh, by the way, Obed is uh, a word, a Hebrew word that means servant or slave. So, um, yeah, here, and Obed, Edom, Jehiah were doorkeepers for the ark. So let's just let's just hold on to that. But so, but but here's an amazing thing: David has just said, in no uncertain terms, we must seek God after the due order. We must not innovate in worship. So. Let's learn how to sing and play musical instruments and introduce cymbals and psalteries and, and all that right now. Wait, isn't that innovating? Isn't that seeking him on your own terms? Apparently not. Have Apparently, you? instrumental music, there was some small precedent for it. And now David says, and it's time to really push that. And God is not upset with it. So while there hadn't been prescriptions for musical instruments in the liturgies or the feasts that we've been given, didn't God point out one specific family for instruments? Well, he does. Family? Are you thinking oh. of something else? What? Right. Yeah, I was does. thinking earlier, like in Exodus or something. Maybe I'm making stuff up. No, there's the, there are the men who were good at, the men who are in Exodus that are pointed out are those who were good at making stuff in general. Okay. And of course, Miriam and the women went out with tambourines. But no, um, the only, you mentioned the feast days, the Feast of Trumpets. Right. Um, trumpets of various sorts were allowed and encouraged. In fact, were part of the ritual. So that was, there was that. Uh, and I thought there, there were those skilled in musical instruments, but I guess this is what I was thinking of. This is probably what you're thinking yeah. of. Yeah. So this, this, this is one of the positive things that becomes, becomes a big deal here. There, there was no prohibition in the Mosaic Covenant or, or earlier. Uh, there was no prohibition against musical worship or singing. And we know that one of the Psalms, at least Moses wrote, what is it? Psalm 90. 90, yeah. The title says the Psalm of Moses, the man of God. Uh, and there's Deborah's song, and there's a song of the wars of the Lord at the uh, at the crossing of the Red Sea. And, and other little songs. Of, well, there was a song in the in the desert when they were digging water, spring up, oh well. <laughs> Which became splash, a praise song back in the 70s. Yes, exactly. But this is a time when that thing for which there was some most certainly divinely given precedent suddenly just mushrooms into this big thing here. And it will survive into Solomon's temple. But it's not born with Solomon's temple. It's born here. And there's the, the reason I'm making a big deal about this will, will become clearer in a little bit. Anyway, David uh, takes on the priestly linen and... Dances before the Lord. David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, and all the Levites that bear the ark of the singers, and Kenaniah, the master of the song, with the singers. And David also had upon him an ephod of linen. Thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant, and the Lord was shouting, joyful noises, with the sound of the cornet, horns, pipes, and with trumpets and with cymbals, percussion, making noise with psalteries and harps. 
and this is the occasion in Chronicles. This has been really any time with it that Moses, that uh, Michael looks out and despises David's enthusiasm and worship, and costs her being the mother of the heir of the throne. But we skip over that in chapter sixteen. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for. They offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings before God. So God's presence is there. It's not just this empty box. God is there. And when David had made an end of offering burnt offerings, the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. And they had this big feast. And again, we get a name of the people who were there doing the music. Uh, he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord. That is, they became permanent, permanently assigned there to record and to thank and to praise the Lord God of Israel. Chief among them is Asaph. As you read through the Psalms, you will see Asaph is the author of many of the Psalms. And again, musical instruments, psalteries, harps, cymbals, trumpets, continually before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Then on that day, delivered, uh, David delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord of the hands of Asaph and his brethren. And we have a psalm that appears, appears in various forms in the book of Psalms, but it's here too. And what's significant is it's this psalm was written to be played and sung by these people with these musical instruments. So again, this is kind of a, a liturgical revolution where God, and, and some and some of the, I haven't read everything here, in some of these texts, these guys are called prophets. Mm -hmm. They're prophesying with symbols and with music. Yeah, It's not that God is being, God's not sitting there saying, what are they doing now? God is inspiring them to write the Psalms and to play the music and to prophesy by means of these things. And as um, David writes this, he rehearses the history of Israel. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But something we, some of the things we get near the end should, well, are interesting, let us say. He sings these kind of things. Give unto the Lord, you kindreds of the people, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable, that it shall not be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let men say among the nations, the Lord reigneth, let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice and all that's therein. Then shall the trees of the wood sing out in the, in the presence of the Lord, because he cometh to judge the earth. I'll give thanks to the Lord, for he's good, for his mercy endureth forever. Save, uh, save us, O God, out of uh, God of our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name, and glory in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord. And so on. Do you notice the nations, and the mm -hmm. earth, and the world? This there there is an emphasis here, as there is throughout the Davidic covenant, which is what we talk about next time. Not simply about Israel surviving, enduring, or militarily conquering her neighbors, that little corner of the land we call Palestine, but there is a great deal here, and there throughout the Book of Psalms, about the nations, about the Gentiles. God is coming to not only rescue His people, but to call the Gentiles to worship Him, to come and worship at His footstool. So that's that's a huge background here. Now I'm gonna at this point because I'm sure we're I've used up a lot of time. I don't even want to look at the clock. <laughs> Some things that happen from here on out. Uh, David wants to do the next step and make a more permanent palace for the Lord, and God tells him no, through Nathan, "No, this isn't. You're not the one. This is not the time. Good idea, but not you." But God prophesies. Nathan the prophet prophesies. You want to make God a house? No. God's going to make you a house. He's going to give you seed, and that seed's going to reign forever. Mm. And we'll talk more about what that means next time. But when David hears this, he goes in before the Lord and sits down. Now, that mm. is incredibly huge. Because the one piece of furniture that did not, did not exist in the tabernacle was a chair. The priests were never done with their work, since it was typical of what Jesus would do. So they never, ever sat down. The priests never rested. They went home at the end of the day, they rested in their houses, but not in the tabernacle. It was a perpetual site of perpetual work. And so there was no place to sit. No, the only person enthroned in the tabernacle was God himself. But now David, as an adopted son of God by this covenant, comes and sits down at the right hand of his father. And he hasn't struck him dead with lightning. He, God, receives him, and there's no inter, we're not told there was an intervening sacrifice or mediating priests. This adopted son of God goes right into the presence of his father and sits down as one enthroned 
and talks to God. While all about him, there are choirs singing and people with musical instruments praising God. Now, one, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Two, this thing called the Tabernacle of David doesn't get a lot of press from here on out. But note that it is on Mount Zion. And when Solomon builds his temple, it's not on Mount Zion, it's on Mount Moriah, which is like next door. But as we read through the Psalms and through Isaiah and the other prophets, as we speak more and more about the coming of Messiah's kingdom and about God's greatness and what God's going to do for his people, the name that comes up again and again associated with God's presence, his kingdom, his power, and Israel's future is never Moriah. It's Zion. And there are lots and lots of people who have sung songs about Zion in church. Zion, city of our God, we're marching to Zion, um, and so on. Halting we, towards Zion. <laughs> halting towards Zion. Uh, yeah. The writer of Hebrews says, you are come unto Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And in um, Revelation, there are 144,000 standing on the Mount Zion with the Lamb. Mm. That becomes the symbol of God's kingdom, of Messiah's kingdom, of Messiah's coming. And Moriah as a name fades into the background. And yet the temple was on Moriah. So what happens? Well, when the temple's built, the the ark and that worship kind of just moves over and plants itself, God plants it in, in this new temple. It's as if Mount Zion moved and mm -hmm. went over there. Because whenever we talk about the temple, when the prophets talk about the temple, they say it's on Zion. Geographically incorrect, covenantally exactly right. Which means we, we maybe should look a little bit about at this. And there's two more passages. I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, the last chapter of Amos, when, at, after many prophecies of judgment, destruction, God says, but wait, there's going to be a time when I'm going to turn all this around. And in chapter 9 of Amos, in verse 11, he says, In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all of the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. The Behold, heathen that are called by his name? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay, that should, that, all right, I was going to go on, but let me just stop there. All right, you're good, you, your first reading is going to be, well, so that old way of worship, God's going to revive that. That's kind of, well, the temple was a lot nicer. That's what Ezekiel talked about. What is Amos going on about? Oh, but we are going to possess our enemies, Edom, and all of the heathen. That means military conquest, right? What do you mean they're called by God's name? What? Since when are the heathen called by God's name? I don't know what he's talking What is this talking about? I don't know. It goes on like this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of the grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they will build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof, and they shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled out of their land, which I've given them, saith the Lord thy God. So it sounds like the restoration period, Israel's coming back from captivity, and God's blessings are going to be so abundant that what the, before you're done sowing the crop, you're, you're sowing it, it's growing, it's springing, and it's producing fruit that's already being harvested while you're still sowing so that the, the hills are just pouring down wine and milk and all this other stuff and everybody has their land and everybody's comfortable and safe and excited. And in these days, God, Israel will possess the heathen who are called by his name. And so, and, and that's how the book ends. And no, there's no further mention of it until Acts 15. This is the Council of Jerusalem. Simple background. Paul had got, Paul and Barnabas had gotten in an argument with certain Judaizers, certain Jews who thought that to be a good Christian, he had to become a good Jew first. He had to be circumcised, keep the Mosaic dietary laws and such. And they fought them on this. this the, in their minds, this is justification by faith. Is this is the gospel. It's saying, do, trust in Jesus and do something else. No, that's not it. 
And so the thing that finally is appealed up to Jerusalem, to the apostles and the elders who were there. And after a long debate, you know, we think, this one's obvious, guys. What's your problem here? Well, 1,400 years of doing it one way is the problem. Tradition is very strong. You mean God's asking us to change everything we've done for, you know, that's weird, an old-time religion. Right? It's good enough for Moses. And so Paul has to, to argue and Barnabas Peter has to explain yet again, this is like the fourth time, how God had um, first used him to open the gospel door to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And so finally, after that, and then Paul and Barnabas come back and declare all the miracles that they've wrought among the Gentiles. That is, God has supernaturally sealed their ministry. Signs and wonders, just like the prophets. And everybody's being quiet and saying, mm, mm, mm. And James says, men and brethren, this is James, the Lord's half-brother, hearken unto me. Simeon, Simon, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them the people for his name. Referring back to how Peter had described him going to Cornelius and preaching the gospel. God poured out the Holy Spirit, baptized them with the Holy Spirit, and then Peter baptized them with water because, you know, obvious here. So, and to this agree the words of the prophets. So this is... James is saying, this is not something that came out of nowhere. This is what God said he would do. We, we just missed it for 1,500 years. Uh, and the prophet, he says prophets. So he's just quoting one as a sample. He may have at the time have quoted others, but the one that's recorded for us is Amos. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will begin, I will build up the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord who doeth all these things. Possessing the Gentiles turns into the Gentiles calling upon God. And James has no sense that he is distorting the text. He's simply saying, this is what it meant. You should have seen it. Israel's going to possess the Gentiles, not by military conquest, but by evangelizing them and incorporating them into God's kingdom. And when that happens, the worship will not be the elaborate worship of the, of the tabernacle or later of Solomon's temple. It's going to be that simple worship of the tabernacle of David, where we can come into the presence of God, sit in God's presence. You notice when we go to church, we sit down. Mm -hmm. We eat the Lord's Supper. We sit down. Jesus invited us to his table, not to stand there but to sit there and to eat with him, to eat with one another in his presence. And because this is where the whole explosion of musical instruments and singing started, presumably then this also carries over, that this is where we have uh, authorization for using musical instruments in church worship. Uh, because church worship is like the tabernacle of David. Now, it carried over also to Solomon's temple, but it started in the tabernacle of David. And so, and, and, and also Gentiles, remember Obed-Edom? Gentile apparently becoming a Levite. Well, now all God's people are going to be Levites in the sense that they will all have access to God. They will all be priests and kings to God. They will all have direct access to God through Christ. Uh, and it will be a much simpler and in some ways yet more beautiful kind of worship being adored by music that lifts up God. The, the um, Levites lifted the ark up in a physical sense, lifted God up and exalted him. Now we get to do something that's as great and greater by singing God's praises and lifting him up publicly in the midst of the congregation. And we're back to that, O thou that thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Mm. Where, where, where is God? He's in our praises. He's in our songs. When we sing his word, then God's there and God's in our midst. And it's okay to have musical instruments to do that with, although there are some Presbyterian bodies that would demur from that. Yeah, those particular Presbyterian bodies, I I love them. Oh yeah, I, people, they're uh, great people. I just want to preface that before I completely disagree with them. <laughs> um, it it has never made the most sense to me um, that when the fullness of the gospel came, that suddenly worship would we we would lose a an aspect that contributes to the richness of the praise right like god is a god of beauty and he does find pleasure in 
you know, acapella voices as well, sure. but it doesn't, it doesn't track in my, in my mind mm-hmm. that God would say, okay, now this thing that's really beautiful, we're going to take it out now because it was Jewish. It was, it was mosaic only. And now it's gone because no. Christ has come. It does, it does not track for me personally. Mm-hmm. And along with that goes with the exclusive psalmody discussion Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. it seems odd that God would not want us to sing about Jesus by name or that he would have us sing, you know, praise the Lord with harp and lyre while not actually using any harps or lyres. (laughs) It's like, maybe we've lost something if we're so hung up on using the exact words, which aren't the exact words, but a paraphrase to make it metrical in English. Well, there's um, that, yeah. While not actually obeying the words. Now, of it, course, yeah. one, one of the retorts is, well, it also says to bring sacrifices. And you're yeah, going, the sacrifice of Thanksgiving. Uh, you know. <laughs> and, we, and, and, and there, there, is, there is a uh, to, to do them and, and to remind us that there, yeah. there is this fine point of at what point do we allow metaphorical language to enter the Psalms? I am extremely com- uncomfortable. When a pastor says, come, let us worship and bow down and let's kneel before the Lord, our maker, may all stand up. <laughs> yeah. I, that's not what, the, well, we're bowing down in our hearts. Okay. There's a word for that. <laughs> bowing in our hearts. Ding, ding. It's called Gnosticism. Um, oh, and so, I'm in a different place, so I don't have my bell to ring. Yeah. We, we, we have oh, to. No. Be, yeah. We, we have to be careful, obviously. And I think everybody probably agrees with this that some of the language can legitimately be transferred through New Testament images because the apostles do it all the time. Paul, I poured out like a drink offering. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. We have ample justification for that. Mm-hmm. But to some other things, we, we need a little more proof than just a blanket assertion that these things aren't allowed anymore. Mm. Um, is, is there any verse that says, or any passage or argument in Scripture that says that the human voice should was for a time supplanted by musical instruments, but now God has restored that. Do we not rather see in the book of Revelation, both in heaven and on Mount Zion, that we have the saints using musical instruments? Well, it's using the language and the images of the Old Testament. Yeah. And? <laughs> is there, and, and can you produce something that says, and that's all they are? I mean, you know, there's there, there's there's an incense altar in Revelation, so maybe you could you can find an argument that way, but you need to make it. You can't simply assume it. And and the New Testament, unfortunately for a lot of us, is rather short on information because it assumes we've mastered the old and doesn't really feel it needs to repeat a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's uh, and and of course the emphasis is simpler in the New Covenant. Which for which we have got thanks. If you if you're if you've just planted a missionary church in some obscure corner of the world, and they can hardly have two in our economy nickels to rub together, you can't really expect them to have a cathedral or an organ mm-hmm. or even necessarily a guitar. And if yeah, all they sensors can do is, to swing and an yeah. altar to decorate, and <laughs> if all they have are there are warm human voices, and they get together under a tree, God's completely satisfied and happy as long as it's around the gospel. Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, worship can be very simple, and there's nothing wrong yep. with that. Uh, on the other, to say that um, something that God put a huge stamp of approval on and that is echoed as being basic to New Testament worship, in fact, it's an emblem of New Testament worship, the tabernacle of David that God restores, not, the, not Solomon's temple, not the tabernacle of Moses. Tabernacle of David is the symbol and when it came, it came with musical instruments. It came with sitting down in the presence of God. It came with immediate access to God. Which of those are you going to slice out? Um, it came with Gentiles becoming Christians, becoming believers. So, and, and 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 not to end on a note of argument, I think the basic thing we're going to walk away with is just a great deal of joy and excitement mm-hmm. for the sheer simplicity and beauty of gospel worship and how it is not Gnostic. It involves the whole man. We get to get in there with our voices, even those of us who don't sing very well. And those who maybe don't sing but can play musical instruments or have senses of rhythm or can only bang together some cymbals. I'm sorry. I'm sure that's a great art. I just don't know anything about it. They all, we all can participate. We can all celebrate God. And it can be a big, loud, beautiful thing 
And it doesn't have to be something where we bow down and, and, and contain everything within our insides. Mm. It can we're be not, a big extra We're not thing. Eastern mystics who... We are not Eastern Where worship mystics. is sitting with ourselves and looking inward. Yeah, we're not bowing into our navels. Um, <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> you know, there was one heretical group in the East way back in the early church that focused on the navel because it was the center of the man's spiritual being. They were called the navel worshipers. Uh, I believe they. <laughs> I believe their leader has a feast in the Eastern church now. Um, that is but, interesting. Yeah. But again, let's end on the positive note of it's okay to go sing. It's it's go. It's good to go play musical instruments and to train. And you know, you know, here's the side effect: when worship includes music, the whole culture will, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the whole culture will be touched by worship. Not everything has to be a worship song, but you know what? If you learn how to play the piano, people are going to grab you outside of worship situations and say, "Hey, we want to sing. Come play the piano for us," and you probably will. <laughs> um, unless you're a teenage boy who doesn't want to pray, play music and praise band because it's you're too cool. But you know the rest. <laughs> the rest of the world, when they grow up and get a little more mature, and they're asked <laughs> to come. They, My mom gave me music lessons for some reason. I guess this is it. You get out there, you start playing music, and music flows out into the entire culture. And this is a wonderful and beautiful thing that we need to we need to thank God for. I'm not push into a corner yep. with embarrassment. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I think that's as good a place as any to wrap up the discussion. Thank you so much for the discussion. Uh, do we want to move on to recommendations? Sounds good. I'm sure then Emily has one. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I recommend kombucha. Ah. So I've not been drinking alcohol for the last several months for reasons, reasons that may be obvious. Um <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I, you know, I really enjoy interesting beverages. So the the first trimester not being able to drink coffee because it turned my stomach, that was a real, real rough time. <laughs> oh, no. But anyway, kombucha is great. Um, it's very interesting and it's supposed to be exceedingly good for you. So there's that. Um, it does at first taste like it's exceedingly good for you. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the brands that you get, I don't know. I haven't tried making it myself. I'm not quite that crunchy, but um, <laughs> the the brand that I have settled on and enjoy is I don't know, Doctor something. <laughs> I should have looked at the label um, before I threw it away and tried to talk to you about it. But uh, yeah, I tried one a couple years ago called Health Aid. Um, the coffee shop where I worked sold that brand and. I honestly didn't enjoy any of them, but this other one, which if we ever do show notes again, I'll put in the show (laughs) notes. Um, Anyway, try different kombuchas. They're good. Put some slices of fresh fruit and it's like, it's like as good as a cocktail when you can't have cocktails. Yeah. I, um, I found out very early on into my relationship with my now wife uh, that she loved kombucha and Mm. I know her favorite brand I know what it looks like. I can't remember the name offhand. <laughs> but if I go to the store, I know what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> and I can surprise yeah. her sometimes. I now, I don't like it that much, personally. Yeah, I, I have a question, which maybe you two might have answers for, because I, I don't. It just seems that at certain times within certain circles, particularly Christian ones, things that my generation never heard of, suddenly everybody knows and likes and talks about, like mm-hmm. kombucha. Yes. Yeah. I, I know how it entered our experience. Well, first of all, our pastor showed us some brewing in his refrigerator. And it was disgusting <laughs> words. <laughs> That's um, why I haven't made any <laughs> myself. I don't think I could still. <laughs> but, but then before too long, my girls were picking it up from their Slavic friends and now are becoming connoisseurs of the thing. And, and then here you are. Record. Suddenly everyone knows about this stuff. <laughs> so my question is not so much about this, but. What is there a transmission belt here, or is it just sudden <laughs> intuitive experience? We all at once all decide that this new thing's great. Is is it being transmitted from one denomination or, to, or, or the Christian tradition to another? Any thoughts about that, or is that just I feel like speculation? It's mass marketing. I mean, that's the same thing oh, yeah. with alternative milks, right? Like, uh, yeah. 
oat, oat milk, milk all of a sudden is available at every grocery store where a few years ago it, is it was a very complete good. specialty. Uh-huh. Same with like cashew milk ice cream and whatnot. I, don't had, know. I, I, th- I would feel like it would hang on the marketing industrial complex. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely think it has something to do, especially with more recently with more things that like flare into popularity, especially yeah. as like uh, social media like TikTok. Uh-huh. is huge remember remember last year i'm still on i actually i was on the train before it was a tiktok trend and i still uh-huh. am on it when sea shanties were a thing oh yes yeah. my girls have been doing sea shanties of late i didn't know they were a thing i thought it was just them fact, uh, well it was it was a huge today, thing singing a sea shanty <laughs> speaking of which, it, it was a huge thing everyone was doing it last year like in uh Whoa. in june or something like that so I, I'm not sure what the reason is for your daughters doing it now, I but don't. Um, <laughs> it's it's great. I don't know. <laughs> they're, they're the last to jump on trends. Usually they're the first, but I don't know. Yeah. In any hey, case, hey, I, hey, I do hey, think and it's up. She rises. Who's she? Hey, hey, up she rises. Yeah. Who's the, who's the hey, she there? Isn't it's it the, the ship. ship. Is it it's the, the ship. ship. Yeah. So is That's the ship my guess. rising up out of the ocean? Being what's? Yeah. I, don't I don't know, but it's early in the morning. Okay. <laughs> I figured it anyway, was. Yeah. I, just, I just realized that it's not a submarine, so I wasn't sure. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, I'm um, I'm going to recommend because I did this last Sunday. Holding babies. No. Oh, oh. Holding babies is a good thing. You know, when my my eldest daughter was first born, I was very frightened because I'd seen all the TV sitcom things about new dads holding babies and how they always screw it up and hurt things, hurt children. And so I, I was, my, my wife reassured me. And so she, she gave me Emily to hold on many occasions. Mm-hmm. And a couple of times when she wasn't in the room, I dropped Emily. And, <laughs> but kind of and Emily's fine. Lap. And Emily was fine afterwards. Yeah. yeah. She didn't even cry particularly. I was like, what? Um, and so I, I, I found out that it, it wasn't this big technical thing where you have to do it just right and you have to be trained and licensed and, and all that. Just just be careful and don't be stupid and don't do anything too terribly violent. And the babies are very resilient. And, and if you if you love them and are careful with them, they're not going to break. And some babies really like to be held. Uh, our friend, uh, Our friends, Emily and Jacob, have a little baby. <laughs> and apparently she likes me at least well enough to let me hold her for a very long time. She has your that. birthday too. Oh, does she? I did not realize that. Yeah. Anyway, so that was really neat. And what was what was interesting to me though was the people who walked by and said, You're holding a baby. Okay, I have well, what was Rude. What, made it, <laughs> what made it ironic was that two of my daughters were standing within like six feet of me. <laughs> also, no, not just that, also holding babies. <laughs> Because moms in our churches were just giving babies away to be held. And I got this one. And um, I was just fine with the baby. But it, w- it was nice. It, I, th- I think there's the, the humanizing factor. He can hold babies. Wow. It's, <laughs> but it also He's not just you. a fancy elder beyond the rest of us. He can hold yeah, babies, he too. He can hold babies, yes. I, 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 too, have a minor dose of the superpower. So, <laughs> but I, I think there are other more compelling reasons that have to do with humanity and mm-hmm. learning to love children and and not thinking too highly of yourself as well. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, things can happen. Like the child can mess all over you or throw up all over you. <laughs> and in this case, the child suddenly decided to throw her head back real fast. <laughs> and, Making a bid for freedom. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and I, 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 I had her just fine. But that when she did that, it scared her. And so she started going into cry mode. And I tried to comfort her. It was unsuccessful. I had to give her back to mom. But, um, <laughs> you know, so I was like, okay. We're all human. Rather than <laughs> saying we all put our pants on one leg at a time, we all hold babies and sooner or later they cry. <laughs> it's okay. Hold a baby today. Yeah, take, some I, so off, take some weight off a of mom. I was listening today to a uh, interview with Jordan Peterson. I was talking to a man about the role of fathers in a house. Mm. A really good interview. If, if we ever do show notes again, I'll put a link to it. <laughs> but he talked about when he and his wife first had kids, he was he was very scared. His wife was like ready to have kids, you know, and, mm-hmm. and he was a little bit hesitant. And he's like, okay, here's the deal. If ooh, let's, let's have these babies and 
you take care of them for the first two years and I'll take <laughs> care of you. <laughs> That's the deal. <laughs> and uh, yeah, anyway, it was it was entertaining. I feel like there there was a lot of good to come out of that perspective of that's that's kind of what dad can do at that point but there's also yeah you do learn to like the kids <laughs> yeah but sometimes it taking care of i understand the priority of taking care of your wife who's recovering and i did a lot of that i remember making my wife a lot of different foods to help get her back on her feet and, and produce milk and all that kind of thing bringing her lots of uh, creamy strawberries and fried mushrooms and such but you know what? While she's down, somebody has to watch the baby. Yeah. <laughs> That's and, part yeah, of taking care, it's care part of her. It's taking care of your wife. You can, you can say, I'm just going to take care of you. No, you can't because taking care <laughs> of her is taking care of the kitchen. And um, I got, my wife needed lots of sleep. I got really good uh, with Emily, my Emily, that she would, that she would, <gasps> I would hear that from the other room. I would roll out of bed, run around our bed, down the little hallway, dive underneath her <laughs> crib, come up with her pacifier and stick it in her mouth. Just, just go, ah! <sighs> da -da -da. I, I was really fast. Da -da -da. Was and so and Kate, I managed to do it without waking Kate up, which was, <laughs> you know, kind of a necessary thing then. Mm. She had and Emily had that uh, blue binky for Ever she called it the Baba. <laughs> okay, but, uh, do, has everybody Brian? Have you done yours? I have not done mine. Oh, I actually you. I have uh, four things to recommend. Oh, uh, oh boy! Because this was a very good week for uh, recommendation worthy <laughs> things. The first is a food, which is um, possibly also something that uh, everyone has at once decided is a popular thing now, but that is lentils. Because oh, mm -hmm. they are high in protein and yeah. and very cheap, a bunch. They're very cheap. I was very happy with that when we went mm -hmm. shopping and picked them up. But we also picked up a new instant pot pressure oh, cooker, uh -huh. yeah. and so we made like an Indian lentils uh, soup stew thing that was phenomenal. I was surprised it didn't have meat in it. It was <laughs> that good. I was like, yeah, this doesn't have yeah. meat. I'm I'm amazed. Uh, but lentils, if if you're interested in healthy eating and stuff it's mm -hmm. very very tasty uh we also made uh ethiopian style chicken mm. uh, one of my wife's friends is ethiopian and she came over on sunday night and helped cook uh berberi is the name of it b-e-r-b-e-r-e -E -E, uh chicken which is a spice blend very heavy on paprika and it's delicious so anyway mm. uh that's, that's the first thing uh, the second thing is a movie, and that is uh, Knives Out, directed oh, yeah. by Ryan Johnson. Uh, and I only mention it because in the past week, uh, the director put on his Twitter like a short clip from the sequel that is coming out later mm. this year. Yes. And I'm so excited <laughs> because the first one was so good. And it's like the main character, it, it, he's got like his vibe as love letter to mystery novels and mystery adaptations so uh -huh. very heavy on the poirot references mm. and the uh you know more than one like kind of sly reference to the clue movie uh, <laughs> as they should be as there ought to be uh so i'm very excited to see what he does with the second one uh, but the main character is sort of this southern gentleman who goes by the name of benoit blanc and he speaks in a very um <laughs> ina inaccurate southern stereotype accent but it's played by daniel craig who loves Who's the role not southern or even american exactly so it just all of that phenomenal together. yeah daniel it's craig so as benoit blanc like i want eight more I'm so glad there's a sequel because I'm going to ask for seven more sequels. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he they're booked for two more sequels already. Wow. Oh, good. But the wow. second one is uh, is coming out this year. Anyway, so that's the second thing. Uh, the third thing is an activity, and that is working out because mm -hmm. that is something I did not really focus on too much in my life until I actually got like married and needed to stay alive longer. Uh, <laughs> And it, it it also sucks. Like working out when you haven't worked out for a while sucks. Uh, but it was both nights we went this week. We 
the first night we were like, all right, we're doing it. We're excited. And afterwards we're like, we are sore and we are tired. <laughs> and the second night we were like, I don't even know if we want to go. And I was like, we always feel better after we go. And then we felt mm-hmm. better after we went. Yep. <laughs> and it was great. Yes. Uh, and then the fourth thing is a book, uh, which all of you have read and probably a sizable chunk of our listener has listeners have also read uh is out of the silent planet Ooh. by c.s lewis which i have just started reading with my wife reading to my wife verbally the third book is the one i'm most familiar with and the one that i i believe is probably the ps de resistance of the trilogy that lewis wrote space trilogy but out of the silent planet is also very good and i'm excited to read through it because i think the last time i read through it myself was in high school mm. uh, at cornerstone so those are my recommendations um go go forth ye listeners who <laughs> heed it and uh enjoy <laughs> so uh with that i guess we'll uh, we'll wrap up thank you both of you for joining me for this conversation it was a pleasure you can follow us on youtube rumble facebook where we occasionally drop dank memes and uh you can also find our podcast on any variety of podcast catchers that you could think of name or hope to dream of if you like the show you have thoughts you have questions you have angry comments for the last one don't email us but for the other ones you can email <laughs> us at halting toward zion at gmail.com We'd also like to thank our financial supporters. You help us keep the lights on, metaphorically speaking, and pay for the software that we use to edit these episodes and get them out to you in a timely manner. Uh, If you would like to join our financial supporters, you can do so and support us at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards Zion. And also, finally, a huge thank you to David Maxson, who is the editor par excellence of this podcast. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much. 